deeply into it now and yes. then I want to have this podcast and thank you for accepting our invitation. So I just uh, told you in my introductory, you've been in Mongolia for over altogether seven years in three different posts and first one is uh, working for a conservation project uh, uh, under the Ministry of Environment. Yes, I yes. worked on three different conservation projects. Ah, mm -hmm. They were all with the Ministry of Nature and Environment. Mm -hmm. And the first one was based in Ulaanbaatar, but we visited many places all over Mongolia. Mm -hmm. We were preparing the first Mongolian biodiversity strategy, mm -hmm. conservation strategy. That time, why is that? That time, didn't we have any kind of a strategy, or is it just different way of producing it? Or no, you didn't have one. That oh. was the first one. Since then, there's been other versions, but that was the first one. Mm -hmm. And it was while Mongolia was setting up a, a network of protected areas. Mm -hmm. National parks, kind of. Yeah. yeah, national parks and nature reserves nature reserves, yeah. and natural monuments, mm -hmm. strictly protected areas. There's four types of, of national... I think areas. before that we used to have Tarkham Tzatz I don't know because I was small, I didn't really mm -hmm. know, but it seems that the Tarkham Tzatz is basically now national parks, isn't it? No, the Dakhan Satskatsar is a strictly protected area. Strictly protected, ah. And the national park is Tsotsulbur. Tsotsulbur. Tsotsulbur Katsar. Ah, uh-huh. You come to Mongolia to help, to... That was many, many years later. Many years later I came to Mongolia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My doctorate research in Nepal was in the 1970s. In the 70s. And I worked oh. in the Galapagos Islands, oh. and I worked in China, I worked in Tanzania, mm. and... Oh, great variety of biodiversity. 1995 I came to Mongolia. So when you come to Mongolia, obviously the Mongolian uh, nature, the biodiversity is completely different from the other countries you have had worked, yeah? Yes. So it's very... Very different. High yes. altitude, the climate is very... Extreme, yes. very cold winter, yes. very okay, not very, yes. but it's very hot summer, yes. and uh, and it's a, a huge diversity within the country. It's a huge country, mm. and it has the it's where the, the desert and the steppe and the forest meet. Mm. So it's it's really a, it's, it hasn't got the the species diversity that the tropics have, of course, but it's important for these unique habitats and a unique combination of them all in, mm -hmm. in one country. Mm -hmm. It's probably got the highest diversity of mm -hmm. the Central Asian countries because they all, all those major biomes come together in mm -hmm. Mongolia. Mm -hmm. So the first appointment, or I don't know, first post you mm -hmm. helped to produce a strategy, was the next post between? Next post was, was a development of that one which was to look more in detail at one particular area. Protected areas are important mm -hmm. for conservation. They're vital for conservation. Mm -hmm. We have to have protected areas. But they're not enough alone. And so there was, it was important to, to, in one particular region, show how protected areas 
and land use in between can fit together and ensure the survival of the the characteristic species. Because we are not having it. Yeah. So we, the GEF, the Global Environment Facility, and Mongolian Ministry of Nature and Environment selected Dornod as well, Eastern Step. It was Dornod and Kenti and uh, Sukhpatar IMAX, mm -hmm. three IMAX involved. And that was a project really to concentrate on one region of Mongolia and develop uh, conservation planning and implementation in that area. We concentrated a lot on research too. We funded a lot of research, joint research between Mongolian institutions and overseas institutions. Mm -hmm. What's the specific about the Eastern Amex, the biodiversity-wise? One of the main interests there is the Mongolian gazelle. Uh -huh, yeah. Enormous Hundreds numbers of them. Thousands. Yes. Or many and that millions. was a, a, one of the research projects which we funded with the Wildlife Conservation Society. Mm -hmm. And the, the project was sharing costs. Mm -hmm. So, to protect gazelle in well, well, what and we protecting do? gazelle, you, it's no good having a protected area here because they range over yeah. the whole, the whole area. Roaming around, yeah. Yeah, and they want to go to China too. Yeah. Where well, there's a fence on the Chinese border, so they very often they can't get through. So they, they were dying, piled up against the fence on some yeah, occasions. Yeah, part of the fence, or, yeah. But a major part of it was trying to fit together the various land uses, the, the mining. There was Especially oil the, mining, yeah. particularly that, mm, yeah. oil drilling, Soko at that stage, it's no longer Soko. But the land use conflict with migratory species like that was an important thing to look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So did they listen to, to your strategy policy or what yes. you have produced? in Because yeah. there still seems an issue about, especially it the mining is. booming in Mongolia. That's yes. the, yeah, mining is a big problem. It also, the animals in the ordinary livestock mm. is also the number of yeah. livestock is increasing. The livestock since then, since we started work there, have increased by three, three and a half times. 22, mm. 25 million up to 75 or yeah. even, some people say 80 million now, yeah. which is too many. And despite the high death rate on occasions of uh, during so, the Zud and, uh, mm -hmm. and 2001 I think there was a bad one, 2009 another bad one, there's still the numbers are increasing mm -hmm. and it would be much better and it's within the power of Mongolia to resuscitate the rangelands, there's a lot of damage from from overstocking of livestock, overgrazing and just trampling yeah. too yeah. but there's a there's possibility to reverse that but it's, it means changing the whole mindset from the more animals you have, the better, to fewer but good conditioned animals. Yeah. And that means changing the way we market them, probably. Has your, has your strategy suggested that? Mm. At that stage, change mentality that, in... that I'm jumping now to the third oh, project. Okay. Yeah, yeah, carry on. In the in whole time have you worked? In you know, the project was based in the in the west of Mongolia, based in Hoft. Mm -hmm. But there we developed an actual strategy for the Altai, Mongolian Altai. Mm -hmm. Those three, well, it was half of Ko Altai and Uvsai Aimak, Hoft Aimak and, and Ulgi, Pain Ulgi. Mm -hmm. And there uh, one of the, the suggestions. There was a joint production of this strategy with the governments of all those four IMAX. They all came to various meetings mm -hmm. there in, in, in Hoft, but also back in Ulaanbaatar. And everybody agreed that it was necessary to reduce the number of livestock. livestock. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, there's, there's not enough actually action. Do it now and development of incentives to, to do that. 
Yeah, but uh, we, st I mean, uh, if, if I may say, but we mm. still, the government policy is still high on encouraging the increase the number of yes. livestock because they're rewarding the yes. people who has a million, ah, a thousand. Yes, so uh, marching. that's mm. why I think it's a belief that this is, some people feel, I think politicians also feel that it's not good for their, their election prospects yeah, if they're talking mm. against... Mm against livestock herding but it's it's not against it, it there's livestock herding will have to be part of the future but yeah. it could be much better managed and i think there's wider acceptance of that now mm. many yeah. many people in mongolia realize that yeah. and there's yeah. programs lots to, of uh, to do that. programs and lots of international organizations is you know, are, are making attention that. on this yes yeah because i i work for uh, sustainable fiber alliance uh, which mm. Uh, also, part of our project is to uh, conservation works to yes. decrease mm. the uh, degradation of the pasture land. And yes. things, yeah. So I can see that you know lots of uh, other organizations really try yes. to help and work together. And that's an example that the Kashmir of a big change in the proportion of goats in the herd in the in the national herd. Yeah, it went up from about fifteen percent to to I think around 50% or just under 50% of the herd yeah, in some yeah, areas. Almost uh, 30 million goats, which is yes. yeah, one third of one, the... One third of the total. And yeah. in, in some areas it's up to almost 50%, in, in some areas where they specialize in, yeah. in so yeah, that, that's why they And goats are particularly damaging to the... Yeah, to the, the pasture land, yeah. 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 So yeah, that's why the SFA is yes. also concentrating on not encouraging the... Yes. On, uh, Coming on more Kashmir, mm. also you yes. need to protect yeah. the pasture land to do that. You but need to decrease the, yes. the amount, uh, amount yeah. of the goats and also increase the quality of the... Yes. You know, uh, and it's shown Kashmir. that rangeland can, div can recover, can recuperate if it's protected. Yeah. Not, not all, some places are really badly affected and it would take intervention to recuperate them but many areas you just have to fence them off and you can see what happens after one or two years yeah yes. it's it's yeah. yeah i think the green gold project did lots of that kind of yes suicide yeah. project did lots of and uh, of some of the show the examples as well yeah. Yeah. yes mm. Mm. so you worked in a capital city eastern part of the mongolia then third post was the western part of the mongolia yes yeah uh, fascinating so you basically mm. You have a deep knowledge about the Mongolian biodiversity and yeah. conservation policy. <laughs> well, I have some. I wouldn't say it's deep. And I haven't been working full-time in Mongolia for a long time. Hmm. But after 2009, when I left the, the project in Hoft, I have been, since then, I have been back on occasion. I worked on various shorter-term assignments in Mongolia. Assignments. Yeah. But also, one other thing is we're going to talk about this uh, special bird you are very interested in from your studenthood. I yes. Guess. And then it's a harzla. Yes. Even even I didn't know until Segi told me the the uh, uh, Doctor yeah, Andrew. This uh, one. Yes. Uh, studied about harzla. What is harzla? It's a bird. <laughs> then I watched all your YouTube. It's a fascinating bird. And yes. tell me about how you. Well, first involved with Harzla, then come to Mongolia, and what's the difference between English, uh, British Harzla, Mongolian Harzla? Yeah, the dipi. It's called a dipper. Dipper. Yeah. In, is in it called English. like a dipping into the water, or is it? A, no, it's because of their behavior. Meaning. They, they, they kind of. Oh, it's bouncing, isn't it? Bouncing. Yeah. Yes, that's that's the the dipping behavior. Ah, I they see. Call it dipping. Ah. Yeah. Because when I watch the the YouTube. It's, so it's yeah. not standing in the lake, it's just always yes. dipping. Okay. Yes. And so, yeah, that's the origin here. In Mongolia, of course, they call them after the, the parts of the river that don't freeze, the yeah. hearts. 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 Yeah. Hearts. Yeah. And when I was at school in Shropshire, in, in the west of England, near the Welsh border, mm -hmm. I got interested in these birds. I was really introduced to them by my biology teacher mm -hmm. and 
with his encouragement, I did a little study of them for one of my my projects at school. So how old were you that? A schoolboy. I was about 14, 15. Ah, yes. that time. Yeah. yeah, so very young. And ever since then, I've I've followed the ones at my home and where I was, where we were lived in Shropshire. I've I've followed them every year, even though I was travelling a lot. I always used to go back and see mm -hmm. how they're doing. Mm -hmm. And also wherever I was working in the world, if there were dippers there, I was going to look at them. In China, for example, there's dippers. Uh -huh. And in Mongolia, there's dippers. But not in the east and not in, not so much in... Central. In central. There are in Hofskul, in, in, in the mountainous areas. And they occur in Ulaanbaatar too, but... The winter. You told me that because I grew up mm. in the central land, I think. Mm. I've never heard hearts like yeah. the bird. And then you told me there's yes. a tall river they came to. They come in the winter in particular, mm. they overwinter there because they, they come from the higher altitude areas where it freezes too much and come down. But when I was doing this project in the, in the west, mm -hmm. I really was in Dipper country. But my trying to find them was more difficult. Only in the winter, they were very easy. There mm. were lots of them, just on the outskirts of Hoft City. Because there's a hut there. Eh? There's, a, there's a stream that, I'm frozen. Yeah. that uh, flows off in, in, really within walking distance of the town. Oh. So I could walk from my apartment oh, and, and yeah, watch. Oh, okay. Yeah, I could watch just on, oh. on weekends when so I was... heaven for you because you yes. loved the work yes. and you <laughs> But at that stage I wasn't really doing filming, I was photographing. And I was recording and watching and just interested. But I always wanted to find out where they nested. Mm. And I asked the local ornithologists in Ulaanbaatar and also there in Hoft, nobody knew where they nested. Mm. And so I looked out for them on summer field trips, but I wasn't, I wasn't there to study dippers, I was working. So I, I had to go where we were doing our consultations with some governors and meeting the national park rangers and mm -hmm. protected area rangers. So it was on the side, as it were. Mm -hmm. I was looking out for dippers, but I never, I never found out where they bred. Well, it seems that it wasn't studied well in Mongolian... No, they, they knew there's dippers there, but nobody had, had studied. studied breeding. And, mm. and it wasn't until several years, many years after I had stopped living in Hoft, that Professor Gombobatra from the Mongolian National University in Ulaanbaatar, he sent me a picture. He knew I was interested in, ah, I see. in yeah. these. And yeah. he sent me a photograph of, of a dipper with a, a leaf in its beak. And he said, "I think I've nesting found. Somewhere. Okay. I found where you, where these, where your dippers are nesting under." So I said, "Thank you very much." And the next year, I was in Mongolia for another assignment, oh. but I took little time off, and went to find them, and we found them very quickly, mm. and that really opened up my filming career because I had I found that there was a, a video feature on my camera. Ah, I've I never really used it much before, <laughs> okay. but I, I used yeah. it that year. And then I started going back year by year. And now I go as a tourist. I'm, it's, not, it's not my work, but I just became you're... obsessed with them. Mm. So, <laughs> and yeah. they're, they're different. And that's really why I carried on going, because I found out that their, their behavior is even different from the, from British, from the British ones. Other. They look different too. Oh, and they the last are dipping, yeah. Yes, the baby one. That's a young one, yes. <laughs> the mom is feeding, yeah. Is the the, last the one British ones look more like this, but the Mongolian ones have they vary in their appearance. Some mm. have got a white head uh -huh. and some have got a dark head and they some are white all over the belly and some are white up just to here. Mm. This that's is, a different behaviour now. It yeah, this is up. really interesting behaviour. Yeah. So this yeah. has never been recorded before in, in the Western Dippers, you mean in, in Europe. But this is the first time anybody's seen it. Yeah. And we saw it 
in 2022 in in uh, Hoft, yeah, mm. Tsetsik, so. Tsetsik. Mm. So you didn't see me tell them after picking the, the baby's head and Yes, things. it's a really extraordinary behavior. Yeah. And another interesting yeah. behavior of the of the Mongolian dippers is that unlike here in Europe, the males feed the females when they're incubating the eggs. eggs. Ah. And I think it's something to do with the the energetics of living on a cold glacial st streams. Mm. And the female is, if there's a lot of food, there's a lot of food around, the male can collect food that hasn't got anything else to do. And the female, if she spends a lot of time collecting food, the then eggs. she gets cold and the eggs are left alone. Here in, in UK, the female spends much more time. Every hour she spends you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes away from the nest. But in Mongolia, only three, four, five minutes. So the climate is dominating the behavior of the... Yeah, well, I think uh, so, yes. Yeah. 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 Sound like, yeah. Yes. So also other things that the locals are actually now interested in, because you are interested in this. Yes. <laughs> Funny thing, because I watched Yeah, they, these are people who from the valley there, and they became very interested. And Did they know the, about the nesting and things before? They, they'd seen the dippers, of course, because yeah. they're, they're yeah, easy they're to see, lovely, yeah. but they'd never seen a nest, uh -huh. and they didn't, they didn't know where they nested. But that's because, you know, they've got other things to do, yeah, they're yeah, busy easy. people. Just, yeah. And so they were interested in the fact that we were there watching these dippers mm. and used to join me on many occasions while mm. I was sitting there. And also my team from, the, from Ulaanbaatar. Mm -hmm. So the other things also that you mentioned in the, in the program and the uh, films, you said, this is the indicator of the clean yes. water, isn't it? It's a very good right. actual indicator. Of yes. If the stream is a bit dirty, they don't come back. Yes, that, that's really one of the one of the important features of the mm. the dipper. It's a they can only live on unpolluted rivers because they eat these little tiny insect larvae, and they eat some flying insects too. But those insect insect species they require very clean water. They can't survive if it's polluted either with too much nitrogen, which you can have from too much in livestock, or from uh, minerals leaked from mining, for example. Mm. Mm. But in, or from human sewage, in this country there's, there's that problem too. But the water there in those streams is really pretty good. Mm. And that, yeah. so the dippers of are abundant in those areas. But if they then become less abundant, that's a warning sign that something's wrong. Mm. And the local people were rather, they liked this idea that these dippers are a signal that our water is, is See, good. Yeah, good, yeah. And there's concerns that upstream in some of these places I was looking at dippers, there's mining concessions which are opening up and one herder told us that the the mining company the Chinese company had permission to extract water from one stream for, for servicing the mine ah. and that can also be a problem because if you take the water away that's even more fundamental it's not yeah. pollution it yeah. so it's it's the amount of water and the quality of the quality. water which is important for them that's a good indicator yeah. also it seems they are very clean birds keep cleaning their poos and uh, yes, the gold in. Under, under the nest here, yeah. you can see the, the, the traces droppings, of the yeah. droppings. Yeah. There's one actually not taken away yet there. And they take the droppings away partly to make the nest less conspicuous to predators. Because ah, otherwise it becomes immediately yeah. conspicuous. Very often their nests are directly above the water and then the droppings drop straight into the water and there's no problem. Mm. But that particular nest was on a slope and the droppings tended to accumulate. Oh, I see. And, but they were really busy taking the 
dropping Constantly away. Constantly cleaning. Yeah. That came earlier in the film, but it's it's no, they're just really yeah, busy. It's fascinating birds. Yes. <laughs> last few, a week or so, I just watching this yeah. film. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It re and that also they seem to be very persistent here in Mongolia more than in England. In England, about a week before the young ones come out of the nest, that we call it fledging, mm -hmm. they, the adults stop taking the droppings away. But in Mongolia they carried on taking the droppings away, look, taking it away mm. there, taking it away here. Yeah. Yeah. They take the droppings away even after you saw just now, even after the first um, fledgling had left the nest. So that's another, that's in England, they, they allow it to become like ah, this. Ah, I see. About a week before they come out. Ah. But in Mongolia, not, they, they carry on. Ah. This one's coming with food now. Yeah, that's uh, babies. Yes. <laughs> so that it's, it's fascinating that, that somehow they stay in there, isn't it? It's like almost like a, can easily fall out from the nest. Yes. But, and yeah. they, they, but they, I like the other things because you said you don't want to disturb them because one of the Mongolian guys said, "Why can't you film from the bottom?" And no. Yes, one of the local yeah, people yeah. asked me. But I, there's a danger if you if you disturb them, they can just yeah. come out, and they scatter, and although they're adapted to, to go to the edge and call for food, they can survive for a bit. But it's a risk, a risk that they mm. will be eaten by some predator and so it's really important to just leave them undisturbed yeah. and my approach with this I'm, I'm there as a tourist I'm, I'm observing I'm not there as, yeah. a, as a researcher Contracted or whatever they're I'm not to, yeah. marking them or putting rings on their mm. legs and so I'm not catching them mm -hmm. and so I've got no right to interfere like that yeah, that's, that's a this good point. Res <laughs> research has when you do do some interference, has is very important. We we learn a lot from marking animals and putting radio mm. um, t transmitters on them. You can it. find out where they're going and, and other kinds of telemetry. Mm. But they all require you to catch the animal, and that has some some impact on whether the animal then is is really as frightened of you or not mm. and I really like well, just sitting and watching in this case this is my approach here mm -hmm. yeah. and I think one can learn a lot about these birds and other birds and other, yeah. all, all, wildlife all wildlife by just yeah. sitting and watching and it's a, not, not got the excitement maybe of running around catching and putting putting radio collars on on big cats or something. I can see because you always have a team go, yes. go with you. Yes. They are kind of your fellow... Uh, they're not specialists, they're, speci oh. but they've but become interested. They're yeah. coming for... Uh, your students or something? Or no, they, who would carry on this study? From, or? Because I, I went with this company, Mongolian Expeditions, and one's a driver and one's the camp assistant, but they've become so interested Inter that they start observing They're just themselves. tourist company people, but now it's... Yeah. <laughs> I see. But they become so interested that they, they're doing their own research almost. And, so how much Mongolian actual researchers or scientific people show their interest in studying? Well, the, as I said, Gombo Bhatta and Olam Bhatta, he's been helping me with some of the, the translation and the commentary and Nyambayar from the Wildlife Science and Conservation. He's been interested all the time and I've, I've uh, talked with him and his colleague Seven Mir Dag about this. But I'm not there officially as doing work with them no, because okay. I'm there as a tourist yeah. <laughs> and so I haven't taken on research students. I've been asked to but I've, I think I would like to do that. Mm. But I would like to do that with the proper arrangements for my yeah, for my stay in Mongolia. I Not don't that want just to, a tourist in the No, I, yeah. I can't do that as a yeah. tourist. So, yeah. I this is my my hobby, hobby, and 
I'd, I'd do it. It would be it would be good because if also you know because it's Mon the world's in Mongolia. If some yeah. Mongolian researchers are you yeah, know, I would like to. I think it's then, because I won't be doing it forever, yeah. and I would like to be able to pass on some of the. I don't know. It's just an assumption. Mm. You know, it could be a good indicator of how mining companies doing for the nature. If they yes. dip it, stay okay. You're doing okay, kind of yes. thing. One of the tick. For yes. the it would be nice. Isn't and it? the local people could have them as their totem, as their symbol of, yeah. of their clean river. Yeah. The the British. Um, the, the, these are British stamps. They've just oh, issued the stamps. Yeah. They've just issued a dipper stamp. Ah. Mm. So they're how all, many different all water, varieties water birds of... in, in Britain? But this is mm. given just now. Mm. This is a, a recent issue. They're called special issues of stamps. Ah, I see. Mm. So we need, yeah, Mongolia. <laughs> Maybe yeah. Mongolia could do that. Could too. do that. Yes, good idea. Yes. So are you going to, I know it's your hobby, but are you going to write in some books or stories yes. about Mongolian people? Yes, I'm, I've been waiting until I've covered the, the main events in their, their lives, the building the nest and, and sitting on the eggs, feeding the young ones in the nest and feeding the young ones off the nest. And this year, 2023, I went again specifically to try and find this behavior of standing on the oh, back yeah. because it was so extraordinary. Yeah. I've talked with many biologists in Mongolia and outside Mongolia and none of them really come up with a, a, a absolutely explanation. convincing <laughs> explanation of what, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so this year we went to try and see that again but we, we couldn't see it again. Ah. But I think it must have it must occur again. So I feel that it would be nice to to introduce a, a student to this phenomenon, phenomenon who could then carry on and yeah. and think about it and, mm. and do observations in the future. Maybe from Hoft, mm. uh, someone who lives nearby from yeah. in Hoft, the Hoft, uh, Hoft the University. The current go governor of the Hoft, uh, Polderma, Miss, Miss, Miss Polderma, I think you told me her father worked with you. Eh? Her father, Inkbat, yes, he, he worked, well, I worked with him in, in both in the, on the first project I did, the one in Ulaanbaatar, and also in the second one mm -hmm. in, the, in the Eastern Steppe. So, oh, and also in, also in the in Hobt, yeah. Oh, Although it wasn't quite so closely working in. Yeah. I'll, he was I'll, already I'll in the ministry. Ms. Bodrum, I, I had a meeting with you. Now, now when you go to half time, then she's there to give, help you greatly, I presume. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we we tried to meet up this year mm. we, when, just before we left, but it didn't work out. Mm. Okay, thank you very much for your mm. time and, and uh, fascinating. <laughs> yeah.